Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right. It is good to see people. <laughs> Not through Zoom, although I know we're being, we have uh, participants joining via Zoom, but um, for those who are not in Zoom, I know you're in a very comfortable uh, room here. Nice temperature. Anyway, I'd like to um, offer a warm welcome to everyone. It has been quite a summer, but more importantly, quite a 2019 school year. I'm only happy that I'm no longer having the title a rookie superintendent. I think I've been through the ringer and uh, proud to say that uh, it was a wonderful way of actually getting to really learn more about our district. More importantly is getting to know a lot more people across the district. Um, so we are changing up a little bit this year because that's what we do as educators. Uh, we are not able to have our um, kickoff at the theater. Um, we're not able to watch our cheer dancers or cheerleaders. Don't worry, I won't subject you to uh, watching me do a dance. I'll spare you from that trauma. So we are doing our roadshow, coming to every school, welcoming staff. And also I've spoken to, had a chance to meet with our transportation crew and uh, uh, nutrition and dining who of course very graciously today prepared lunch for everyone. So I'm just very proud to have the chance to share with you some of the big picture ideas that we're thinking about this school year. I was here yesterday, I was doing a little tour of the building and you know, uh, you know with a board member, just kind of showing off the work that's happening. Uh, the windows are beautiful. Um, of course the locker rooms, the library, looks stunning and I know it brings a sense of inconvenience to some of you but I also know I was telling Beth is like renovating your kitchen you don't have a sink for a while you don't have a counter for a while it's so inconvenient but you're always looking towards what it could be the potential and after a month or so of renovation you try you enjoy it for many years so it's going to be the same our kids deserve a uh, top-notch kind of environment so please bear the inconveniences of construction. And I know that hopefully uh, the work will complete soon. So for this morning, we will just very quickly, we're gonna try to stay under an hour. I just want to share a little bit of our three-year vision work. Um, the document right now is in print and ones that comes through, will have a chance to dig in more on the document so that you and I have a better understanding of what are some of our goals and targets in the next three years here at Freeport? How can we work together purposely, especially think about this? This building is the last stop for every student in this district. And let just that sit for a moment. This building is the last stop for any preschooler who comes in this district this building is their last stop. That means we have to think differently about the way we see educating children. I am going to put a lot of focus on pre-K and kindergarten because if we are not sending students or leaving kindergarten without reading, of course, developmentally, we're always playing catch up. Our SAT scores is a K through 11 score. It's not just junior year. It's a collection of learning from kindergarten all the way to 11th grade. And that has to really sink in with each of us that the work we do has power over every student's life and future. So I'm just gonna give you a really nugget of what our three-year vision work is because hopefully moving forward as you move through the academy model, you can see the connection of your work with the district vision work. 
Because again, a successful district only happens when every stakeholder in that district understands why my work matters and what am I doing to contribute to the future of a child who comes through these doors as a freshman and out as a senior. Well, after my summary, I'm going to give the microphone over to Dr. Julia Clote, who is our new executive director for curriculum and instruction. And she's again going to just give a big picture sense of what teaching and learning is going to look like this year. And then Dr. Shalanda Randall is our new equity assistant Sue. And my challenge to Dr. Randall is this, equity is not a department. Equity does not function in isolation. Equity is not for black kids who are suspended. Equity is the way we teach. Equity is how we see our purpose, whether we teach orchestra, band, uh, debate, athletics, it doesn't matter. We have to be able to see equity across every fiber of the work we do. So that's my challenge to her. It's not a selection of PD that you're gonna sit people through and do a survey at the end if they got it, but you don't see it happening anywhere in the building. That's part of our challenge. And a familiar face, Jack Code, will walk you through again special education students and our advocacy for special education students. Our data tells us 0%, 0% of our special education students are at a proficiency level. That's on us. That's on us. We can make every excuse possible in this world but until we understand that all kids are capable, but they learn differently, and the type of services we offer matters to children, that's on us. Our mission statement used to say, in partnership with families, students, and the community, we will commit to a community, something like with, um, what is this, with um, the challenges of today and the opportunities of tomorrow. One thing that's really important as a district, if we're going to grow as a district together, is not so much we memorize the mission statement, is we understand the what, the why, the who, and the how. So our mission statement has evolved from just saying, providing kids the challenges today, opportunities of tomorrow to saying, wait, what are we committing to? We are saying we're committing to three things. Innovation. We want to be an innovative district. Today is an amazing opportunity for all our kids to really see this in practice and what it looks like. This means we can no longer, as we are content experts, we still want kids to have equitable access to content and the rigor of that content. But we have to begin to think about what is the quality of task we're putting in front of kids? When do I get to hear kids talk about that content? When do I hear discourse in the classroom and the application of discourse through writing? Because if the only way we think about educating children is through in-person, we're going to be disappointed because we have over a thousand kids who signed up for remote learning only by choice. That's a staggering number for our district. 10, 1,000, about 40 something now who signed up for remote learning. So we can't no longer say only the in-person kids will receive quality education. We have to start thinking about innovative practices that are meaningful. I was talking to one of you, well, I won't say yesterday, lengthy conversation about teaching. And I was sharing that 
when I had my eighth graders who I knew were reading far below eighth grade, I can't read books that are for third graders to them because I had to give them equitable access to content. But I started to understand no matter what background they came from, all kids want to learn. And maybe it's not even showing. Some of our kids come with just so much challenges in their life that learning is the least of their priority. But engaging kids in the kind of learning, if you're teaching history and that time of history, and you could bring them into problem solving and opportunities for them to work together and understand why this keeps happening in our world and have them put together based on your rubric or your standards, what opportunities they have to engage in research and writing and discourse. Our kids can do it. I know they can because I've had the toughest kids in front of me and they were able to do it, but it was a lot of work and it didn't work all the time either. The next is inclusive. We want our kids to see themselves as part of a community. We want our teachers to feel and our paraprofessionals and our counselors, we want everyone to feel you are part of a dynamic community that when you come through these doors at Freeport High School, you have a signature in that kid's life. I still have the chills when we graduated the class of 2020 outdoors. It wasn't the same. Not everyone showed up, about a little over 60. But that's okay. Every one of those kids who step on stage were darn proud that they wore that Freeport colors. And that's what we want for every kid. In a student-centered learning environment, in your academies, whatever career path, that's what it's about. That's what you're doing for kids. That's why you're taking so much time in your pods, in your learning communities, to learn, to teach, differently that elevates the way the kids see themselves, which is the next line, so that all students are equipped and empowered to choose their college, workplace, and career path. All we want for kids is the same thing you want for your own kids, nothing less. They'll get there differently because they have different experiences. That's all I want for every kid in Freeport what my own children had because they could stand up and make decisions on their own and live not a rich life, a productive life. These goals were written even with you in mind. Every student graduates with meaningful employment. Every student has access to a diverse, rich and rigorous curriculum. Every student has access to social emotional supports and every resource and talent will be used to support and enrich students educational experiences. This is one of the call to central office, a wake up call. Whether you are in HR or you're on the education side or the finance and business side, facility side, everything you do needs to contribute to improving and supporting teachers' work and elevating student achievement. That's the work. If you don't have that in mind, then it's not gonna happen. People need to start understanding everything I do is about how it impacts the schools. My work is not to get in the way of principals. My work is to support the principals and assistant principals. I should not be the barrier to your work. I should be examining policies that get in the way of us understanding how do we do our work better. Less bureaucracy, less politics. That's why 
I love being in schools because if I'm not, how do I make decisions? I don't even know what's going on in the buildings. There are three big commitments in the three-year vision. The first big commitment, the first row, sorry, first column, academic excellence. The orange boxes, the four orange boxes under academic excellence are the components. So you got big commitment, academic excellence, four components. The first component is standards aligned rigorous instruction. The white boxes are the strategies in the next three years to achieve standards aligned rigorous instruction. So every department right now in central office is going is putting together their strategic plan for year one of the three years. Because you can't do everything at the same time. You got to prioritize. The second component is reflective and empowered educators. You wrote this. Your representatives wrote this. They gave it to me and said, in the next three years, here's what we want as teachers and educators. We want to, we want to make sure that professional development is designed with the need of the teacher in mind. Stop that PD that's meaningless. Stop the PD that's one-stop shop. You go and you're done. But make sure professional development reflects the needs of teachers. The third component is highly competent and visionary school administrators. Why? Because school administrators have a tremendous impact on your work. School administrators have an amazing impact on student achievement. How do I know that? Because I've seen it over time and time again. So pushing school administrators to really start focusing on domain three, which is improving teaching and learning. Because we might have amazing things going on in the building, our bands, our orchestra, our music, everything's going great. But the real gift to students is once again, giving them the opportunity to be able to get into a good post-secondary institution and have the skills to be able to do that. And then the last component is safe and healthy schools. So I'm not gonna dig into each one of these, Throughout the year, we will do that because this is a three-year uh, process. The second commitment is operational efficiency. Organizational excellence is the first um, component, resource management, and invest in our people. What is our pipeline for leadership? What is our recruitment, hiring, and retention practices for, for teachers to recruit high quality teachers in our district? What does mentorship and coaching look like? The last one is the collective impact. That's where we plug in all our family community engagement. That's where we say, what is our communication strategy? And how are we transparent about the way we present data? It's not as a gotcha but is a reflective tool to help us understand what are some of the root causes of why we continue to see issues persist. Because sometimes we're putting band-aids everywhere. We're not getting to the root of issues. And the last one is the career pathways and opportunity, where we have our CTE programs, the career tech program partnerships, summer school, summer uh, after school activities, and all that. So hopefully what you're seeing, the three big rocks here, is what will sustain Freeport over time? What are these three key commitments if we did it well, kept it simple, and yet comprehensive and deep, and ingrained in everyone? It becomes our focal point for the next three years. These are the core beliefs. Many, most of these are the same core beliefs, but here's always 
what I think. Nobody in our district talked about our core beliefs. It's in a frame at central office. It's in the board office, it's in the hallway outside the board office. Nobody ever talk about core beliefs. And why are the core values and beliefs important? Because without them, anything goes. If we're saying academic achievement is a core belief, that means we know the importance of domain one, which is planning for instruction, understanding critical pedagogical practices, knowing I have to prepare for my class and I can't just give kids, kids worksheets and worksheets and read chapters one to three and answer questions. If that's a core value, that means how do we live that every day as a teacher? Continuous learning and improvement. Learning is a journey. There's no end game to learning. I still struggle with that every day. I continuously have to challenge myself. This job is never over. And I don't want to be the superintendent that is just reactive when problems happen. I want to be someone who can model integrity and behaviors that are supportive of the community. Another one here is equity for all. What does that mean? How do we continue to identify what are the barriers that get in the way? We're going to be challenged with remote learning. It's going to feel different. We will go through days of frustration in person and remote because we've never done it before. I've never done this before. So what are some of the key learnings that we need to anticipate will be challenging for kids? How do you build your schedule? How do you work as an academy in your heal, in your create, in your build? What is the role of your department chair or department leader? And how is it shifting from the typical role to now really making sure that we have equitable practices in place? These are some of the three year targets district wide. One of them is attendance. We will still keep pushing for a 95% attendance in three years. We're at 92 right now. The next is we want to see a decrease in chronic absenteeism annually. Our chronic absenteeism is at 27%. Our African American Chronic absenteeism is over 40%. That's a major red flag. How do you learn when you're not in school? But more importantly, remember I talked about the root causes. What are the root causes of that? What are some of our challenges and barriers that we need to knock down and understand? This is a partnership work. Another one on the bottom is we want to decrease, 5% decrease in disproportionality of out-of-school suspension among African-American male students. When you look at our data, the disproportionality of our data, that's why we got dinged by ISBE saying, hey, your school is suspending black boys more than a certain number, there's a ratio they give you. So again, what, is that, what does that work mean for us? The last thing I want, guys, is us pointing fingers, because that's so unproductive. Again, we got to get to the root causes of these issues. How do we in the primary grades start identifying children that we know will need a lot more academic and mental health support because it shows up pretty early. That's why that preschool and kindergarten, to me this year, will be really key priorities. If I keep sending kids out of kindergarten not reading, by the time they leave that fourth grade and go to Carl Sandburg, they're only reading at the second grade level. By the time they leave Carl Sandburg going to FMS, they're reading at the fourth grade level. 
And by the time you get them at ninth grade, they're reading at a fifth grade level. You see the consequential cycle of this work. So this, this really is a district-wide effort. Keep going, Tom. One more. Thank you. These are um, ISBE accountability metrics. The most important here to me is the freshman on track. Our ninth graders, research will tell you from um, Network for College Support, the A's and B's or their GPAs are a greater predictor of their graduation rate more than their SAT. Your scores have moved. The year before you were at 59% and I know Dr. Summers and I have talked about a little bit of a discrepancy, but you've jumped to about 72% at the end of this year for freshmen on track. Our goal is in three years to get kids up to 85% of our students graduating in four years. Because what happens is algebra is the gatekeeper. When kids fail algebra, research will tell you they really struggle finishing in four years. That's your gatekeeper is algebra. And that's where a lot of effort comes into the freshman academy before they step in here in September or August. A lot of supports for students in freshman year. Counselors, advisories are really critical areas for freshmen because developmentally they're in that stage of uncertainty. But one thing you also got to watch out for, who are the eighth graders coming to you that have shown tremendous growth? They shouldn't start to go down and lose momentum. And if they do, how do we catch that early? So what are some of the data practices in your building in each academy that really mines these kinds of information? So we're never playing catch up. I'm not gonna go through this. This is, I was just trying to highlight some of the strategy under the empowered educators. But this is a three year work. And again, this is all teacher driven. And I'm super excited to dig deep into how can you make connections between the work you're doing and the three year vision. So when the vision gets published, the document gets published, uh, of course, we'll work with the principals and assistant principals, but with you as well to go deeper into it. So now I'm going to pass along the microphone to Dr. Julia Clote. And I just want you to know that there's so much, they're all looking at you, Julia, like, <laughs> I am so excited about this school year. I'm not just saying that to say that. This was the hardest thing this summer was the hardest summer. Dr. Summers and I one time texting just saying, are you just emotion and mentally exhausting? But you know what? When these kids come the first day of school, they don't know that I'm experiencing that. They don't care, right? We gotta all pick up together and share in this work and really get excited about the great things that are happening in our district. And you can't just say that to make others feel good because you need to believe in that. There's nothing I could do to make you believe that. But many of you were born here, raised here, went to school here. And the pride in this district is always oozing. And I'm so privileged to be able to have a piece of that work and to add value to the work we're all doing because our kids deserve it because you deserve it. So I'm gonna leave you with that thought. We'll come back with a question and answer later. And here's Dr. Julia Clote.
Thank you, Dr. Alvarado. I'd like to welcome all of you to the first day of Institute Day and for those of you joining um, remotely as well. So Dr. Alvarado paints a compelling picture for the why, the why of what we are doing every day. And really, she is the type of leader that makes you aspire to do more, to be better. I, I am just been truly, truly grateful and proud to be doing this work. So I thank all of you for welcoming me here in Freeport. Um, I'm here to talk about the, a little bit about the what and how we're going to support you with the how. The what that I've been working with many of you in this room, your colleagues, administrators over the summer has been what I call the continuity of learning. Because as Dr. Alvarado said, it starts with preschool and ends when they walk across that stage wearing Freeport colors. So between preschool and high school graduation, we need continuity in their learning that it, so it all builds, all builds one upon another and when they take the SAT and graduate. So as you know, we developed uh, learning models for the coming school year and decided at the, um, the seven through 12 level that we will do blended learning. We also know that every family's situation is a little bit different. So we offered our families the remote learning by choice. We've had about 30% of our families opt for remote learning by choice. So many of you will be teaching uh, remotely and blended. And we'll also um, be what we want to have a contingency plan in the event we do have to go fully remote. So we are asking all of our teachers to be mindful of that that is a chance and ISBE has, has uh, directed us to plan in the event we have to go fully remote. So we're asking our teachers about the first two weeks of blended learning that we're keeping that in mind. What will this look like in the event we have to transition to full remote learning? So the work that we did over the summer was based on the, the target of a continuity of learning. We want to make sure it's in alignment with our three key tenets from our strategic plan, which is innovative, inclusive, and student-centered learning. So what we had to do for our teachers related to the what of teaching is to really prioritize the curriculum. We all know we are not gonna have as many instructional minutes this year, regardless if we're teaching in a blended model or in a remote model, we're not gonna have as many instructional minutes as we are accustomed to. So we, with the help of your department heads, you've got, we've gone through the curriculum and the standards and really prioritize the standards and content. You're, you'll be working with your department heads in order to learn more about that and help you with the how of teaching that prioritize standards and content. We've been working on equity. And we're in a moment, you'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Randall, who is the assistant superintendent for equity and the work that she's doing in building our equity framework. Um, one thing we know as we return in the coming school year is how important relationships are going to be. Engagement and attendance is something that's all all in the forefront of all of our minds. And we know that with our teens, building relationships will help with that engagement as well as having them understand what it means to have student agency so that they can be more involved in their learning and our teaching can be truly student-centered. So the work that we've done not only is informed by our strategic plan as it should be, but also guidance based uh, that was shared with us in July from the Illinois School Board of Education. So what we did was we took the ISPE guidance and we took our strategic plan and we looked for common themes. We looked for how it related. And what we noticed was that the ISPE guidelines and our strategic plan merged together in four major themes. Those major themes start with curriculum and instruction. And it's that age old question is, what do we expect our students to learn? The next theme that was throughout the ISB guidance, as well as our three-year vision, was systems of support. How will we respond 
when our students need our support. We also had a lot of guidance about assessment and grading. How do we know the starting point of their learning? So we are thinking about assessment for learning, formative assessments, as well as how do we assess that they have learned those prioritized standards and content, and that's assessment of learning. One thing that I'll be talking about in just a minute is the importance of targeted, uh, targeted and actionable feedback. That was a very strong recommendation in the ISBE guidance. We're also thinking about professional learning. So what is the professional learning that has to be in place to support all of you in the coming year? We have a general framework for that, but we're gonna be getting your ongoing feedback for what you need from the curriculum and instruction department, from your department heads and your administrators. So all of that information fed into those four themes, which is informing this roadshow, but also what I'm calling the continuity of learning document. So for the coming year, there are four major considerations as we transition to blended and remote learning. The first is the social emotional learning needs of our students. Our students as, and all of us, frankly, have been through quite a bit in the past five and a half months. So we wanna make sure that we are creating safe learning environments, whether it's blended or remote, that support the whole child. We wanna support their social emotional learning and their mental health. And that is gonna take really thinking about our instruction. We have to prioritize what comes first. And that is um, not only the social emotional learning, but then once we've established those relationships and that supported environment, priority standards and content. We're gonna be thinking about teaching and planning for teaching in ways that are different than we have been before. Um, many of us have never even heard or considered synchronous and asynchronous instructional design. Now it seems like those words are everywhere. How are we thinking about synchronous or real-time learning versus asynchronous, which is on-demand learning? That's how we're thinking about our instructional plan planning. And we're looking at priority groups and tiered supports and how, what that means in a blended and remote environment. We're talking about assessment and feedback and also equally importantly, how we're gonna communicate with students and their families in order to promote engagement. So what do we expect our students to learn? That's our first question. As I mentioned, we worked all together all over the summer to prioritize the curriculum and the standards, and uh, you'll be working with your department heads on that. Okay, next slide. And we're also thinking about how to design lessons in ways to make them more engaging. So what you see in, in front of you is an example of how to do that, a 5E lesson design, where you're um, designing your lesson to be engaging, opportunities to explore content, opportunities to explain and correct misunderstandings, opportunities for students to elaborate and show what they know, and then for you to evaluate it. This is just one example that, as a resource that will be provided for you, that shows ways to do that in person and remotely, because often teachers are asking me, well, what does that look like? And we're gonna be providing some professional learning on this and the instructional technology that we have to support that learning. Assessment and grading, we're thinking about this formatively and summatively. And to be very clear, assessment will probably look different this year than it has been in the past for our blended and remote learners. In the past, you may have given more of a content-based assessment. And now we need to switch that and think about how do I assess in more frequently and in low stake ways so that I can have ongoing checkpoints in my students' understanding. How can I assess in ways that are more um, problem-based or project-based as opposed to just a one and done summative assessment? Those are some things that you're probably considering right now. And so the next slide shows different types of formative and summative ways to do that. 
One thing I want to point out before I move on is, is the, as I said, is the really stress the importance of effective feedback. And by effective, I mean targeted and actionable. Providing targeted and actionable feedback to your students, they cited research that says that is the equivalent to eight additional months of learning. We need to give students that feedback so that they can grow and progress in their, in their learning. And we'll be providing professional learning on efficient ways to do that because that can be a very burdensome task when you have 120 English students, students in your English class. So that's something that we'll be talking about too. Okay, some resources available to you. Uh, the parents were who chose remote learning by choice were provided with a resource uh, guidelines for parents. It's something that you may want to uh, look at so that they know the information that was um, provided to them. Um, just for an example, there was a, there's a page in this document that says these are the expectations of the student, of the families, and of the teacher. So it's good information to have. As a resource to all of you, we took the work that was done and the guidance from ISBE from the summer and synthesized it into a continuity of learning document. This document is a guidebook for administrators and teachers to share with you what is the district of the, uh, what is the vision of the district and when we are talking about the coming school year, what are our expectations and help you as a resource. Unfortunately, this continuity of learning document could not include every single uh, scope and sequence or every single curriculum map that we have in our district. So we had to create the FSD 145 Learning Hub that will be found on um, fsd145.org and it will be a resource for teachers that will include on-demand professional learning, it will include resources and documents that will help you with your instruction and planning, help you with the what and the how. And now I'm going to introduce Dr. Randall. Dr. Randall is going to talk to you about systems of support and how we respond when our students need support. Thank you, Dr. Plo. So I'm going to talk about MTSS, which is already established within the district. We are going to just align this particular focus so that we are really looking at the needs of all students in Freeport School District. Our goal is to make sure that 85% to 90% of our, our students are meeting what they need, meeting their needs academically in tier one. So we're making sure that our students are on grade level with the curriculum making sure that the interventions that we have in place are meeting the needs of the majority of our students at each grade level, as well as our interventions through PBIS and all of our behavioral support systems are really focusing on 85% to 90% of our students. But in particularly what Dr. Avalana mentioned, we really want to make sure that we wrap ourselves around the ninth graders coming into high school making sure that they're properly prepared to move effectively throughout their high school years so that they are more successful as they leave the, the school district. Now, we will have students who may not ac actually meet the needs in those tier ones, and we have to do a little bit more to assist them. And so that small population of students, we would like to move them into tier two and provide more evidence-based intervention, more isolated instruction to meet their needs, and to really provide assistance to help them come back to tier one so that they can effectively move through uh, the, the process of graduating and going on to post-secondary experiences, either work-related or college-related. However, excuse me with the mask, <laughs> However, with tier three, we do have students after all of the interventions have been put in place 
have they behaviorally or academically and they still are not as successful as we would like for them to be, then we would utilize the documentation with those types of interventions and have them in tier three and possibly continue to individualize even more their needs and have a specialized plan for them before we consider moving them on to special education. So we really want to focus on these three areas and making sure that we're providing the accurate supports, the accurate uh, academic supports and behavior supports that all students need. And so I'll talk about about that when we hit the next slide when we talk about equity. But we want to make sure that we look at what do we have in place now at the high school. Because MTSS will look differently for our high school students. We have AVID. How can we utilize the components in AVID so that they can filter to all students school-wide and not just AVID students? How can we look at how to support students in our challenge classes and gift it how can we move them and make sure that they're receiving an equitable education in our HAP program? Also looking at our African-American students and looking at our students in a multilingual program and students in special education. So we want to make sure that those components and those students and all students are integrated in our MTSS system, especially academically and behaviorally. So why MTSS? Well, this is a state obligation. This is what the state wants us to do because it is our responsibility to provide a quality education. And that's going back to making sure that all students are exposed to on grade level education and curricula. And those students who are not, we are providing supports and interventions to assist them in that area. Equity. Well, as part of the equity framework, we are going to be working collaboratively with the Equity Steering Committee to develop an equity framework that is embedded in what we are doing in Freeport. It is not a separate entity. It is not something that is done in isolation, but it will be aligned to the instructional practices that are occurring within our classrooms. We will be looking through an equity lens at our interventions, in our grading, in our assessments, so the Equity Steering Committee with the development of the equity framework is to make sure that we are integrating our equitable practices, our making sure that we are providing professional learning that, in, that includes bias and perceptions and assumptions of particular cultures and race. And then also, as Dr. Alvarado mentioned, looking at our in-school, out-of-school suspensions, our referrals, our attendance, those particular areas through an equity lens. And then efficiency. We want to make sure that we are data-driven. We are utilizing research-based, evidence-based interventions that will provide us with accurate data that will guide and lead us in how we are better supporting our students. Overall, MTSS is an academic and behavior process, multi-tier support system for all students. We're targeting their interventions. We're targeting and individualizing their supports. We're making sure that we're implementing research-based interventions, curriculum, and best practices in our teaching. And finally, we are valuing culture and diversity of our students, and we are going to respect who they are in the classroom through an equity lens. Our professional learning will continue to allow us to be critical thinkers because at the end of the day, what we want for our students in Freeport is for them to be successful citizens in a global society. We want them to leave Freeport better students, successful students, and those who can contribute back to our society. And now I'm going to introduce Mr. Jack Cole. Thank you, Dr. Randall. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to try to speed up the presentation here. But I'm here to talk to you about, first of all, welcome back. I guess I should say that, right? Um, and welcome to all those uh, remote um, special education. Dr. Randall spoke a little bit about how we um, support our students as we go through the tiers of uh, multi-tier systems of support. And at some point, we may get to the point where 
a student may need some additional support through special education. Um, and key to this is those students. They're in the center. They've got to have voice in what they need in, in their learning, especially at the high school level. They know what they need. Um, and we have to involve all those stakeholders. So administration, staff, parents, they all have to be engaged. And we have to keep in mind that first and foremost, all our special ed students, all our students with 504s are gen ed students first. So they've got to be exposed to that curriculum. Otherwise, we're never going to move that needle that Dr. Alvarado spoke to earlier that our students aren't achieving in special ed. And one way we do that is through collaboration. So we have to really have a collaborative model in how we approach the needs of our students. And we all have strengths that we bring to the classroom. You're the content specialist a lot of times. And our special educators are the specialist on how to adapt and um, create assessments for students that we're really giving them what they need in the classroom or in the environment. And key to this whole thing, they need to be in that gen ed setting as much as possible that least restrictive environment. Because research will show us that if we pull students out and put them in a special class, there's a negative impact often on achievement. So the more we can keep them in, the better. So whatever those supports might look like, um, our special educators will do that, our special ed teachers, sometimes we'll have paraeducators in there supporting students in the, and the staff, so they'll be helping you as well, helping with some of those adaptations and things like that. And as Dr. Randall spoke to, there is, a, there is a way that we look at problems or concerns that may arise throughout the year. So we're looking at defining what that issue is in the classroom or with that student. You know, is it an academic need? Is it a behavioral need? So, and we gotta analyze it. What data do we have that supports that there is really a concern? So we bring that out, we look at that, and then we create a plan a plan for the students so they can be successful. And then absolutely, we have to monitor. So we've got that intervention in place. We're monitoring um, how they're responding to it and then we adjust as needed. And then ultimately, um, we may have to intensify that support as we move forward. And we all know this process. Once we've gone through the tiers and we see that students are really struggling, we go through the IEP process or the 504 process where we will evaluate if they meet criteria and the state and the federal government give us, gives us all these disability criteria that we have to meet. Um, if they meet that eligibility criteria to get some instruction that's specialized because that's key, not only does the student have to have a disability that's identified, but they also have to have a need for specialized instruction. So just because a student has some struggles, maybe it's because they just have some attention deficit. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily gonna need specialized instruction. So that's something that we have to consider through this process. And again, it's all hands-on. We've all gotta be engaged with our students to make sure that we're giving them what they need. And again, you've gone through this process with um, meeting the needs of students, looking at that core instruction, that's key, making sure that they're giving, we're giving the students everything they need, and specifically at the high school, that transition. What are they doing once they leave our doors? Is it college, is it career, is it independent living? We've gotta prepare them for that path and make sure they have all those skills that they need as they move forward. So I went through that very quickly. And if you have questions, please reach out to me and I can respond to any questions you have on IEPs or 504s but I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Clote um, for English language learners. So I just wanna highlight very quickly uh, for our multilingual learners, I can simply say that just as in the special ed uh, presentation that Mr. Clote just provided, uh, our multilingual learners are also identified as a priority group. So it will be a matter of addressing the needs, whether they are newcomers, bilingual, or receiving EL supports, working with the gen ed so that they are not only addressing their language needs so we can continue to advance their language proficiency levels, but also providing them access to the content that you are teaching. 
So that will be our goal this year. As we wrap up our presentation today, we want to make sure that you understand that there is a professional learning plan in place and we're asking ourselves and continually addressing what are the professional learning needs to implement and support our plans for the coming year. So we've identified four strands for this work. The wellness and safety, which involves all of the efforts of the work that was put together through the summer to keep all of us safe in this time. Um, but also the SEL and mental health needs of our students our, and our staff as well. And we'll be providing professional, professional learning and supports for that. Continuum, uh, continue, um, continuum of learning will also be focused on how do we know what those prioritized standards and content are and providing professional learning both on demand, in other words, asynchronous, and synchronous uh, learning environments. And then the instructional technology. You're probably going to use instructional technology more than you have in the past. You're probably going to be using new platforms and, and trying and being innovative in new ways. And we want to support you with that. And then Dr. Alvarado is going to finish our session by talking about the Freeport Community Public School Fund. Thanks, Julia. So this is just a little plug because every month I meet with uh, the Freeport Community Public School Fund. And I promised them that I would just say something about their work. Um, so for those of you, if we have new teachers in the building, that this is a for nonprofit organization that actually supplied over 1.2 million worth dollars worth of educational supplies, materials for our district since 1983. So they've been a very generous partner. Uh, these are some of the items they've funded in the past, musical instruments, science lab charts, um, phys ed equipment, books, you know, phone books. So we're very grateful. So what they'd like you to know is in, yeah, is in early September, they're going to be receiving an email from them. Um, they're gonna send it to each employee. There'll be instructions there. Um, they're gonna be important dates and deadlines for you to be able to submit your requests of any wish list that you have. And then uh, you'll be notified end of November about the status of your request. Okay. Um, so that's really it. They just wanted to make sure that you're aware of their continued work of their service projects for our school and our district. And we're always very grateful for the partnership. So thank you very much. I'm here if you have any questions, if I can help answer them. There was a question at the two other schools about masks. I know you do all this presentation and the questions on masks, but that's okay. It's a question. <laughs> so just like at central office, my directive is if you are in your office and you shut your door, you can take your mask off because you're alone. If you're coming into someone's office and the door is shut, not so that the person in that office who, are, who doesn't have a mask can have a minute or a second to put their mask on. Okay, so it's going to take a lot of practice, you know, so but if you want to keep your classroom door open, even if you're alone, as long as your door is open, leave your mask on, because someone could just come in there and not know that you're unmasked, or just being overprotective. Because we just want to make sure we're keeping each other safe. So again, you want to take your mask off, go in your room, shut your door. You want to go in someone's office or classroom, knock first, give that person just a minute, a second, whatever, to leave, to put their mask back on, okay? It's gonna be a challenge for our kids. Hopefully, you know, everyone uh, follows our safety rules, um, but we got this. <laughs> Was I convincing? <laughs> we got this. <laughs> All right, so thanks everyone. You know, I also forgot, if it's a 90 degree day, 
I said, not this come, not the two days of school, the opening. We're, we're going to come to school. But starting August 29, what is that Monday? 31st. If it's a 90 degree day, uh, if your building does not have air conditioning, we will do remote learning on 90 degree days because it's really tough with a mask on, humidity, and all that. And the way we're going to announce that to parents is like a snow day, the phone call in the morning, like the six o'clock call, but only for buildings without air conditioning. Okay? All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, everybody.